It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone here today to be part of this important observance, honoring the losses of 2020. The losses of 2020 will be with us forever. You might think that losing something means it's gone. That person, that experience, that opportunity, that time may no longer be with us, but something in its place is part of us. We always have our awareness of the loss, the empty space, the memory of dashed possibility, our struggle to make peace with the reality we did not choose. The lives lost in 2020 to COVID-19, and sadly those lost that will be lost in 2021, are irreplaceable, every single one. And yet it would be incomplete to think that deaths have been the only losses. School years cut short and transformed, graduations canceled or re-envisioned, funerals and weddings we could not attend, holidays not celebrated live with family and friends, work that was disrupted or delayed or even lost entirely, justice delayed and justice denied, and so many more. As is often said after significant moments, those who live through it will never forget it. And so I want to thank you for joining us for this COVID Hamet program. The title is based on the Jewish value of Kavod Hamet, honoring the dead. And today, in addition to that, we are also honoring other Jewish values like Bikur Cholim, visiting the sick, Bikuach Nefesh, saving a life, and most importantly, Alti Frosh Min Hatzibur, do not separate yourself from the community. We've learned over the last several months that we are not alone when we are together. And so one opportunity of being together in this moment is for those in the Zoom webinar, if you want to use the chat box to connect with our panelists or with each other, to share stories and memories from this time, to respond to poetry, prose, music, or video images that you see in this program, please feel free to use the chat for this purpose. I'm very pleased to welcome so many of my colleagues in our movement of secular humanistic Judaism to our observance today. This program is presented by the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism in partnership and co-sponsorship with the Society for Humanistic Judaism, the Cultural and Secular Jewish Organization, and Tamara IISHJ in Israel. And so we'll begin our program by voyaging across the pond um, and the sub-pond of the Mediterranean to Israel and to welcome Rabbi Shlomit Myers, who both works with the national organization to Murat IISHJ and is the leader of Sicha Endor in Kibbutz Endor in the Lower Galilee in Israel. Hi, I almost, I almost said good night because it's night here, but uh, hi, nice afternoon for all of you. And thank you for having me. I'm very touched and moved to be part of this. And, um, and this, uh, presentation, I actually want to tell you about this last year for me, my first year as a rabbi, and the things I had to deal with and the decisions I made in how to help others and me and my family. So I'll do it with pictures. First of all, this is where I live. I live towards the Tavor. This is what I see every day when I go for a walk. And it's a beautiful place, but living in a beautiful place is not enough to have a good life. It's great, but it's not enough, but it is nice to have it. And I started this year, it was a very special beginning last November. I mean, last year is November. I was ordained as a rabbi. It was very exciting. I decided to retire from my demanding job as an HR manager and start a life as a rabbi. And I was asked to work with Sivan and I was dreaming about being a part-time worker for the movement in Israel and be a proud grandmother of three. The third one was just born. And then Corona days came and everything changed, of course. And right away when we started, I mean, I had to make decisions in every part of my life, the professional, the community, and the family. And I'll tell you some stories with some pictures about it. And the way I dealt with it is there's a song in Hebrew. Some of you may know Alec Einstein, who was the writer and the singer, very handsome one. 
And he said in his song, all I wanted was to drip a drop because many drops make a sea. And I see myself as a person who drip drops and small drops can make a difference. And I'll tell you about two or three of them. The first one was the professional work. I mean, with uh, IIS and Jay Tumura, we had to decide what we're going to do. I mean, everything changed. We were facing a group of students and rabbis that had to lead their communities and lead their lives and their ceremonies and everything had to change, we couldn't meet. I haven't been to Jerusalem since last March and I live up north and I have to work with Sivan. So we started using Zoom and we realized that we can teach and we can meet and we started before Pesach to meet our rabbis and our students every day, sometimes twice a day. And then during the holidays, Yom Ma'ut and memorials, everything on Zoom and we actually built a community of secular humanistic Jews in Israel that felt that there's a place where they can meet and talk and see how they deal with the new life that we have during these Corona times with all the uncertainty and the fear and the lon loneliness because everyone was closed at home, divided from their families and from some from work and it brought us together actually, because the things that we decided to do and look how we do celebrate our Jewish life together. And it actually brought us with you. I never knew besides Adam, I didn't know any of you. And we started doing activities with you. We did the Memorial Days and we did other things and even business meetings <laughs> of, uh, of IISJ. So it was something that we actually took the opportunity to build a community. The other thing was the community and the kibbutz. Many of us are considered, suddenly we're considered old and people at risk. We don't see our children. They're staying away because they're afraid to infect us. And usually our community, we do Kabbalot Shabbat. We have our own secular sidur and we do many holidays together and we can't meet even in the kibbutz so we walk around but we don't really gather together and everyone was very worried so we started making a, a new sidur which we can see and meet on zoom at the beginning it was very awkward and some people hated it some people still do but some people said this is great we can talk to each other we can ask each other how we feel. We can even sing, not everyone at the same time, but we did. And just deciding to celebrate together made a difference. And we continued to do that. And then after a while, we started meeting, of course, outside when we stopped being afraid so much. And the weather is good, of course. And another thing we did is something that I love to do. I make challah bread, challah bread for many years. It's one of my expertise. And I think that when you make a challah at home, you actually bring in the Shabbat, you bring in the holiday. I teach people to do challot. I love to breed, to braid them. And um, before Pesach, before we start with the matzot, which even secular people do because it's a tradition, we decided on the kibbutz to make challot for everyone. So actually we gather, I mean, we had like 20 people. I put a page together with uh, the recipe of my challah and some blessings, secular blessings and the traditional religious blessings. It's all in Hebrew, but if you want it in English, I will translate it and love to send it. And I sent this uh, page all over in the kibbutz, in Israel, all my friends, and all over the world, to my family, to friends. And on that Friday, my WhatsApp was full of pictures and happiness because the smell was all over. And I felt that that was another drop to make life better at a time of uncertainty. And then came the second closure, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah. And we usually celebrate all the kibbutz together for years. I never celebrated, never celebrated Rosh Hashanah as a family. It was always a community holiday. 
And suddenly we have to celebrate a family, but my kids don't, can't drive. They don't live in the kibbutz. I celebrate with my brother who does live at the kibbutz. So we wrote our own Sidur for Rosh Hashanah with blessings that were right for us and had a table with all the, again, the challah and everything. And there's a tradition in our family, the Myers family, that we have a special food that we make, which is actually, I think it's from Turkey that we <laughs> learned it, that you have nuts, salted nuts with honey. And there's a blessing for it because it's the, all the hard things and not very sweet things that are mixed with all the honey and everything. And my kids and all my family, they love it. They're looking forward for Rosh Hashanah to eat this. So the day before, they started calling, how do you make it? And my daughter's uh, um, spouse, she's calling me. She said, she's asleep. I want to make it for her. So in all the, the holiday tables of the family, wherever they were, they had this. And I keep saying that with good food, we actually passed our love. And another, another drop to make life better for us. We gathered on Zoom for Yom Kippur, the community made it a very special day. And I'll just end with what we said at the end of the Neila of Yom Kippur. I'll say it in Hebrew and in English. When it's all over, we will not talk, just hug, to be infected with love. So I just want to wish us and you all that uh, we'll have a better year, that we'll be well, that we'll be in contact with our loved ones, that we'll find new ways each day to meet them. It can be on Zoom, it can be on phone, we can always send a song, a poem, anything that show people that we love them and care, and it's good enough, even when it's not a real hug. A hug over the Zoom brings love. So thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And now I'd like to invite uh, Rabbi Judith Side, who is one of the founding members of Tri-Valley Cultural Jews in the Castro Valley in California, to offer her thoughts at this time. When someone dies, we miss their presence, their smile, if they're close to us, even their smell but especially their voice. You know, their specific accent, the funny things they said, their laugh, and the way they sang, some beautifully and some off key or desperately out of rhythm, but completely uninhibitedly, whether they knew the song or not. So I ask you now, sorry, I have a friend dying. I ask you now to raise your voices, to honor the voices we won't hear again. And join me in singing Hayamim Hofim, whether you know the song or not. The words mean the days go by and the year passes, but the melody remains, the love remains, the friendship remains. I am im shana over of al hamangina tamid nisheret. I am im Shana over it. Aval ha 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 Avalhachevraya 
Our next speaker will be uh, Rabbi Sivan Maas, who is the Dean of our Institute in Israel, Tumura IISHJ, and was our first rabbi ordained uh, in our movement from Israel. Um, she is currently in London um, and hopes to return home soon <laughs> as, uh, as conditions warrant. So, Sivan. Shalom, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Rabbi Sivan Maas. Uh, this is a somber event in which we gather to remember those who are no longer with us, wish those who lost their loved ones comfort, and wish health and good life to those who are with us. Articulating what you feel and think may help us cope. Some say breathing does too. Many of us get locked at home on numerous lockdowns but we can choose to take care of ourselves and each other while keeping an open heart. We get frustrated when we're suggested tips for communicating better while wearing a mask. Make sure you communication partners has your attention. Face your partner directly and make sure nothing is blocking your view. Talk a little louder. Talk a little slower. Use your hands or your body language. Ask your partner if they understand you. If not, say it in a different way or write it down. Well, it can get frustrating, also in Zoom. Or we can appreciate the advice, realizing that you have just been handed a tool that enables you to better communicate and possibly even listen better because we will overcome because we actually do need each other. Others suggest we should mask up or shut up, talking less, more quietly, or not at all, limits the manufacture of both large droplets or any aerosols. Completely silent, reduces this, the risk of viral transmission. So should we keep silent? No. Tonight, we could be frustrated by the fact we're not all in one room, but on the other hand, we're all here together across the ocean, different time zones, different languages, able to be together with no masks, able to articulate our thoughts, our beliefs, and share compassion and hope. Why does being believers make us strong? Because we are Jewish, secular, humanist believers. So why does being believers make us strong? Being secular, humanistic believers makes us strong enough to be compassionate and supportive to all, all of those who will accept our compassion, will become stronger, will become happier. We offer a practice, a practice of some kind of comfort based on the sense of community, friendship, and a common denominator of peoplehood, values, and our freedom of choice. We believe in values. We believe in science and law. Not all of us do, but most of us do. We believe in family, in heritage, in culture, in our people. We believe in values-based common language, the newish Jewish. The newish Jewish is a new language. In Hebrew, for example, they developed two new languages. One, which is a combination of Arabic and Hebrew, which is called Aravrit, and a multi-gender uh, um, language in Israel. Because we are one, because we are different, because we are able to unite 
but not to be uniform. That is our power. Coming together, talking about our values, our humanistic values, because we are a values-based community. That's where we take our comfort from. That's what we base our, our life. But it's not only that. It's also about what we feel. In 2007, when Rabbi Sherwin T. Wine died in an accident, we were at the memorial in Detroit. And one of the things we talked about was on the one hand, our values, our ideology, the things that we believe in, and the other was love. Remember in the beginning I said, articulating our thoughts, articulating our beliefs, that could be the basis of our comfort, but also breathing. The word ahava is all about letting go, in enabling us to get something back. So let's say ahava together, slowly, every syllable. Ah, ha, va. And then breathe in. And then breathe out again with the same word. Ah, ha, va. Breathe in. I wish you all good health, good life, and a lot of love. Thank you for this opportunity. And now we have a um, recording from Rabbi Denise Hendlarski, who is the rabbi of secularsynagogue.com. Uh, she is based in Toronto, Canada. She wasn't able to be here in person today, but she recorded a message for us to share, which we will do. Hello, everybody. This is Rabbi Denise. I'm so sorry I'm not able to be with you in person. I wanted to extend condolences and very best wishes for full and complete rest, healing, and future happiness for those who have lost somebody due to COVID-19 or any time over this past year. It has been a very challenging year for everybody, no doubt. And it is nice that we are coming towards the end of a calendar year and with the hope of renewed goodness and a vaccine and lots of wishes for wellness into 2021. In the Jewish tradition, we understand that it's very important to mark our grieving in community. And one of the challenges of COVID has been not only the death and the loss, but the loss of being able to come together. So for that reason, I think it's beautiful that people are joining in here. And I wanted to offer a poem that I often read at funerals, which is Kaddish by Marge Piercy. Look around us, search above us, below, behind, we stand in a great web of being joined together. Let us praise. Let us love the life we are lent, passing through us and in the body of Israel and our own bodies. And let us say, Amen. Time flows through us like water. The past and the dead speak through us. We breathe out our children's children. Blessing. Blessed is the earth from which we grow. Blessed the life we are lent. Blessed the ones who teach us. Blessed the ones we teach. Blessed is the word that cannot say the glory that shines through us and remains to shine, flowing past distant suns on the way to forever. Let's say amen. Blessed is light. Blessed is darkness. But blessed above all else is peace, which bears the fruits of knowledge on strong branches. Let's say amen. Peace that bears joy into the world. Peace that enables love. Peace over Israel everywhere. Blessed and holy is peace. And let's say amen. Wishing all of you lots of peace and joy as well. Take good care. And now um, a special piece of music written originally as a poem by Hannah Senesh. These words will be sung in both Hebrew and in English. It speaks of the power of legacy and memory to continue to impact, illuminate, and inspire us. Yeah. 
Now we turn to stories of loss and illness. We have two people speaking today who have lost people very close to them to COVID-19. First, we will hear from Gloria Pinku, who is a member of the Jewish secular community of Asheville, North Carolina, who will share her story. I want to thank you, uh, Rabbi Adam and Miriam, for inviting me. Um, what can I say? I, I'll just tell you my feelings of losing my husband to COVID, uh, a husband that I had lived with for 34 years. What did I feel or how did I feel? I felt all the things that people feel when they lose something. I felt grief, loneliness, helplessness, anxiety, and fear. One of my great fears was the fear of paying bills by myself. My husband did everything and I didn't like doing the math and everything. I was an English major. <laughs> and the other fear, and my husband laughed about this with me. He said, if I die first, who's gonna put your jewelry on and take it off? And that was one of the other fears I had. Well, how did it all begin, the COVID? We had signed up for a actually um, a cruise to go to South America in January. And we were told by the cruise people and everybody else, you'll be okay. The, crew, the, the COVID is basically in Asia, it's in China. So we sailed March 1st and we were supposed to return March 14th. Our last stop was going to be in Chile and the government of Chile refused to let us dock. So a 14 day cruise turned into a, a 30 day cruise. Um, we had to go to uh, California and that's where we embarked. We felt you know, okay for about a week. And then my husband started coughing. We called our doctor. He said, keep taking your temperature. And we said, what else can we do? And he said, I don't know. So this was early part of April. And my husband's breathing started getting worse and worse. And one day, he was sitting in the bedroom and he said to me, call an ambulance. So I did. The ambulance came, put him on a stretcher. And that was the last time I ever saw my husband. I called the next day and had myself admitted. And they had given me some very strong medicine, I guess, because I don't remember very much. I didn't suffer and I was told that I had pneumonia but I never coughed and I was in the next room. I did not realize that my husband was in the room next to me. I didn't even know he had passed away. He had died. When I was in ICU I finally woke up and a couple of nurses came in and said, we're sorry for your loss. And I was moved to a private room and just lay there for two weeks. Suddenly the nurses were too busy to come in and do things for me. But I had a wonderful congregation. And this is why you need friends, you need people, you need congregations because I got hundreds and hundreds of cards. My daughter, my youngest daughter, Elise, kept everybody informed as to both of us and how we were doing. 
And I was told that the congregation couldn't wait until eight o'clock when she sent out emails to everybody telling them how we were doing. And then she told them to send chocolates to make me feel better. <laughs> I got so much chocolate. <laughs> it was just amazing. And then the congregation started a meal train. And after my two daughters left, they stayed to help me and cook for me and whatever. And then the meals kept coming for two months. I had a meal every evening cooked by one of our congregations. All I can say is I'm still very lonely and I still can't get used to this whole crazy world because when I left to go on our cruise, the world was not crazy then. When I came back, I didn't know what was happening. When I finally woke up, I realized that this wasn't the same world that I had left. So what have I learned? <laughs> I'm starting to learn how to pay my own bills, <laughs> learn how to be independent, and learned how to make to-do lists so that I have things to do and try not to be so lonely. The holidays have really been a horror. But thank goodness for Zoom, I could see people. Our congregation actually had a Rosh Hashanah and a Yom Kippur service. And I guess I'm going to have to learn how to be an independent woman. And I have not been independent for 34 years. I really depended upon Daniel, my husband. And I never lived alone for 34 years. I always either lived with my mother or with Daniel. So there are a lot of things that I'm learning at the age of 81 that I probably should have learned much younger. But thank goodness for my children, the rest of my family, and my Jewish congregation. Thank you for having me speak. I feel honored to be with so many rabbis. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, Rabbi Jody Kornfeld, who's the rabbi of Beth Haverim Jewish community in the Chicago suburbs, to read a piece she has written about her loss. Thank you. I hope to have even a, a small percentage of Gloria's grace and calm <laughs> as I share with you what I've written that I've entitled The Unwritten Eulogy. I traffic in ritual. Words are my currency. My aims are both lofty and personal give meaning to those intersectional moments where the present confronts its past and navigates its way into the future. Let the generations join together even as they necessarily and inevitably move apart. Yes, I traffic in ritual. Words are my currency. But now I stutter and stammer because my stockpiles have dwindled the silos have emptied and the vats have drained. Unlike Joseph, I, Yosefa, did not prepare for this. So swap, sorry. So swap the first two letters in ritual, then add a V, and here we are. A Brady Bunch screen. A Brady Bunch screen with someone I've never met next to my father in his ICU bed. Did he give a thumbs up 
acknowledging our voices one last time, hearing our expressions of love and gratitude? Or did she make that happen? This is the unwritten eulogy, the failed ritualization of loss and memory. When words are unspoken, they never reach their audience. They remain vague, unformed thoughts, seeking the release of articulation. The raw materials remain without the opportunity to become something. The inability to weave together the strand of memory with that of loss, the one of hurt with the one of forgiveness, and the thread of joy with that of sorrow means that no new fabric emerges, no textile of reconciliation. Instead, there is a pain and profound isolation that is even deeper because I traffic in ritual and words are my currency. This is the Shiva never held. For the greater good, for the safety of all, due to the pandemic, are recurring phrases in obituary after obituary after obituary. But, that word, but those words give way to the realization that no stories will be shared, no ameliorative laughter will be brought forth. There are no hugs possible. We are back to swapping those first two letters and adding a V. So indulge me this. Let me untangle a difficult and complicated relationship. Let me honor the dead in the pandemic, COVID Hamet, and honor my father, Kavod Avi. In the days immediately after his birth, he was on display in the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago to showcase the then newest technology, a neonatal incubator, because he weighed only two and a half pounds. He was fond of saying, I was very young when I was born, an aphorism that elicited laughter, but which my sister and I only just recently fully appreciated. He grew up in poverty and the depression, the son of a fruit peddler on the west side. Later he'd say, did you have enough to eat as he offered everyone second portions from the excess food he bought? He was a one strike person in a three strike world. He could and did hold a grudge with the best of them, oblivious to the pain it caused, but paradoxically was also generous to a fault. Whatever missteps he took as a father, he corrected as a grandfather. He died alone in a hospital room in the pandemic of 2020 with someone I never met next to him. This then is the unwritten eulogy because I, traffic in ritual and words are my currency. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Beautiful. Sometimes words fail and music can speak more eloquently. And so now I'd like to recognize Madricha Michelle Davis, who is in the Denver area in Colorado and also a professional violinist to offer some words and some music as well. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I will be playing a piece by Heinrich Bieber. It was composed in 1676 and I chose it because it is intended to be meditative. It has a repeating bass line and I just thought it was a good fit for today.
Beautiful, Michelle. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Now I'd like to invite Terry Waslow, who is the Executive Director of the Cultural and Secular Jewish Organization and also a student in the IISHJ's Life Cycle Officiant Program to share, to share some thoughts and a poem as well. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here with us today. There is a precept, a rule of conduct that we follow. To destroy a single life is as if a whole world is destroyed. And to save a life is as if a whole world is saved. We have seen and read about the tireless efforts of the healthcare workers who are desperately working to save lives and scientists who are working to develop remedies to fight this pandemic. Regardless of how challenging it has been, we know so many who have followed all the guidelines, not visiting with family and friends, staying home for months at a time, not venturing out of the house other than for some fresh air, walks around the block, sitting in the yard or the porch or the steps or whatever is available and very far away from any other people. Yet we hear every day about those who refuse to listen to science, who shrug off reason and responsibility, who seem to lack an understanding of compassion for the lives, the worlds that are being destroyed. So far for, during this pandemic, we have heard about and have even been intimately connected to the destruction of over 330,000 worlds in the United States alone and over 1,700,000 lost worlds worldwide. It is incredibly heartbreaking. We wonder how we can go on. When will this be over? Will things ever be normal again? What will that new normal be like? How will we deal with the losses? And how can we get back to a recognizable way of being? As we figure this out, we must continue to cope with and honor all that is lost and the best way we can honor those who have been the victims of this horrible pandemic is to rebuild the worlds that have been destroyed. Each one of these worlds will be different. We'll be missing loved ones, family, friends, neighbors, people we have never had the opportunity to know. Each new world will have a huge void, a hole, like the hole in our hearts of those left behind, but rebuild these worlds we must. We will fill these new worlds with the memories and the wisdom of those who have died. It will take time and it will take tears, but it will happen one day. When will I be myself again? By Rabbi Lewis John Aaron. When will I be myself again? Some Tuesday, perhaps, in the late afternoon, sitting quietly with a cup of tea and a cookie. Or Wednesday, same time or later. You will stir from a nap and you will see her. You will pick up the phone and you will call him. You will hear their voice, unexpected advice, maybe argue. You will not be frightened and you will not be sad and you will not be alone, not alone at all. And your tears will warm you, but not today and not tomorrow and not tomorrow's tomorrow, but someday, some Tuesday, late in the afternoon, sitting quietly with a cup of tea and a cookie and we will be ourselves again. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Beautiful. And I'd like to invite uh, Marla Davis, who is a member of Kohadash Humanistic Congregation in suburban Chicago, um, and also a student in our Life Cycle Efficient Program at the IISHJ, 
and share her experiences uh, with her work. Thank you. This piece is called Gradually and Suddenly. For the past five years, I facilitated monthly support groups for caregivers whose loved ones live in a memory care facility. This past March, like the rest of the world, we began meeting on Zoom. It wasn't long before we decided to connect every other week as the caregivers were struggling not only with loneliness and isolation, but also with grief over not being able to visit their loved ones and fear that by the time quarantine ended, their spouse, sibling, or parent would no longer recognize them. Once outdoor visits were allowed, any hope of a meaningful in-person encounter evaporated since having dementia doesn't lend itself well to compliance with wearing a mask or staying six feet apart. Attempts at virtual visits also failed as already confused residents became even more frustrated when the family member FaceTiming them couldn't be found behind the screen. Many tears were shed during those first eight months as families grieved not at being able to connect with their loved ones. And that was before a single case of COVID entered the facility. We all knew it wasn't if, but when the facility would fall victim to the virus, but nothing could prepare us for the emo for us emotionally for COVID's devastation when in mid-November, the illness spread fast and furiously from one wing to the next. Within a few weeks, over three quarters of the facility's residents tested positive. Indoor visits had not been allowed since March, but now as COVID ravaged the facility, a few families were personally invited inside the community for what was being called a compassionate care visit. The families I worked with were torn when they were offered this option. Even though it was a relief to see their loved one in person, these visits were often reserved for saying their final goodbyes. And some had to balance their own risk with being exposed to the virus against the opportunity to visit in person one last time. One woman who was invited but ultimately declined to visit her husband in person shared that she couldn't live with herself if her daughter, who was already gonna lose her father, be could become an orphan due to the pandemic as well. At this point, the group decided to start meeting weekly as it was clear that some residents would succumb to the disease. For the first time in my career consulting in nursing homes, I bought a package of condolence cards rather than just one at a time. The caregiver support group I had facilitated for the last five years morphed into a grief support group. I too was experiencing profound loss since all the residents who were sick had once been my patients. I now was not only the group's facilitator, but also a member. Each week as I let families in through the virtual waiting room, I sat on the edge of my chair, wondering whose loved one was still alive and whose died. We sat together alone in our homes as families shared the struggle to make end of life decisions for loved ones they hadn't seen in many, many months. Everyone compassionately listened as several members struggled to decide whether to have a memorial service now or a Zoom funeral later. Questions about how to modify or whether just abandon various end of life rituals were shared. There were very few answers, but ambiguity and uncertainty were the common thread that brought these families together in the first place. You see, it was during our last in-person support group in early March that the facilities administrator came in and announced that the families would not be able to visit their loved ones following the meeting due to what she called temporary restrictions. No one was given a chance to say goodbye, but then again, no one thought they needed to. What I found most compelling was that although many families thought they had already grieved their loved one when they were stricken with dementia and entered a facility, no longer the person they once knew, many of these caregivers now experienced an unexpected wave of loss with the finality of death. It was what I would call complicated grief. The grief of losing their loved one to dementia, 
the grief of losing their loved one again eight months ago to a quarantine, and finally, the grief of losing their loved one as they took their last breath. It seemed that all three losses felt both gradual and sudden at the same time. By mid-December, COVID left the facility as quick as it came. About half a dozen patients died of the virus and several others who didn't test positive succumbed unexpectedly. I can only imagine that the chaos of an assisted living community being transformed to a makeshift acute care center seemingly overnight made the already vulnerable population decline even faster. Residents needed to change rooms as one wing and then another became reserved for those who tested positive for the virus. Activities came to a halt and meals were eaten alone. The cumulative effect of being isolated from their families for months was compounded as residents with and without the virus now had to isolate from one another. The pandemic accelerated a disease that had already slowly degenerated their minds and bodies. Every loss is profound, whether expected, unexpected, or a combination of the two. And together, the families grieved gradually and suddenly. We feel the need for healing, not only for those who are ill, but for those whose hearts have been wounded. A song of healing has become very popular in many parts of the Jewish world. It's been adapted now for humanistic congregational purposes. Originally, Misha Beroff by Debbie Friedman. Our adapted version is um, Refua Shlema, A Complete Healing, which is sung both in Hebrew and in English. May the source of strength that dwells so deep within us Help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say shalom. Makom hakoch b'tochenu makorat habracha mihevroteinu May those in need of healing know refua shlema The renewal of body, the renewal of spirit and let us say shalom. I'd now like to recognize Rabbi Greg Epstein, who is the humanist chaplain at Harvard and MIT in the Boston area, to share his thoughts of the meaning of this moment. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am Greg, proud humanistic rabbi. And um, as a university chaplain, uh, I've been fortunate enough to not have any of my students or the, you know, the people that I work with most closely lose their life this year. Um, but uh, I will say that being on campus or really being not on campus uh, has been an absurd journey of its own. And uh, I want to start with something a little absurd. Um, Sherwin Wine always loved to say that, you know, the absurdity of life is, is such that, that we need to laugh at it. So I want to give you permission to uh, laugh a little bit at a um, video that Adam's going to play in just a second. Um, like some of you, perhaps I've been doing a lot of my chaplaincy or my, my work as, as a rabbi or clergy uh, online this year, even on social media. And uh, I'm going to share a video now that I first saw on Twitter, um, where it was summarized uh, as 2020 in a minute. And it's a minute long video. Uh, it's from Barcelona, uh, an anti lockdown protest there from the summer. But uh, as you'll see, okay. this could easily, just as easily, have been America burning this summer. So, Adam, if you would play the video, please.
so you catch that a little bit um the the forces of science chaos and authoritarianism were, were clashing there and and as they were doing that the pianist uh, whose name is peter william gettys uh, played an instrumental version of a pop song by the bangles called eternal flame which uh, is written by Susanna Hoffs, who is a secular, or at least uh, as far as I can tell, a relatively secular Jew. Um, it's, it's eternal flame, right? And, and there was the flame burning in the background, but not quite uh, what, what rabbinic Jews, you know, who talk about an, an eternal flame had in mind, right? That the city was just burning in, in microcosm there. Um, but it's funny because I saw this video um, and I've, I had been, in the weeks leading up to seeing it over the summer, regularly using that same song to sing my son, my four-year-old son to sleep during the pandemic. Um, and I would hold his little fingers on the line in that song, close your eyes and give me your hand. And so that's my association with the song that you just heard. Um, as the, you know, the, the pianist gives a little flourish with his fingers as, as the police cars are literally coming for him. Um, I've always taken that song's meaning to be that rather than miracles or divine sparks or whatever you might associate with uh, the idea of an eternal flame, the real eternal flame is, if anything, loving, tender, and vulnerable human connection, um, which, you know, just happens to be a really beautiful message for 2020. Um, most obviously, you know, it's a love song, um, and indeed, I, I had the pleasure uh, of singing this song uh, several years ago on the Shabbat of Tuba'av at a Cafe Aroma um, coffee shop in the German colony in Jerusalem, uh, with Sherwin Wine in attendance to read from his book, A Life of Courage. But as I said on Twitter uh, at one point, I've been singing my son to sleep. And um, I think it's just this beautiful message for, for parents and their children, um, a worthy alternative maybe to, to something like the religious blessing over children said on Shabbat. Or, you know, its message is really appropriate for anybody who cares about anyone um, and wants to feel more connected in this time in which we can't all hold hands, uh, but we certainly can close our eyes and reflect on the power of our shared humanity. So, share this with you. Close your eyes, give me your hand, darling. Do you feel my heart beating? Do you understand? Do you feel the same? Am I only dreaming, or is this burning an eternal flame? I believe it's meant to be, darling. I watch you when you are sleeping. You belong with me. Do you feel the same? Am I only dreaming, or is this burning an eternal flame? Say my name, sun shines through the rain my whole life, so lonely, and then you come and ease the pain. I don't want to lose this feeling, oh. Close your eyes, give me your hand, darling. Do you feel my heart beating? Do you understand? Do you feel the same? Am I only dreaming? Or is this burning an eternal flame? And now I would like to invite Rabbi Eva Goldfinger to share some of her thoughts and a poem as well. Uh, 
Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you could all be here. It's nice to see such large numbers coming out for an important event. And I'm grateful to all the people who organized it. I come from a Hasidic family, as some of you may know, and they all live in New York or Las Vegas. I've got over 150 people in my immediate family, and every day I worry about them. Many, or I would say at least half of them, have had COVID. Most of them, except for one, have completely recovered. I feel so grateful that I live here in Toronto, and at the moment, I feel safe. I've got food in my fridge. I've got a fridge. I've got a home to be in where so many people are in the cold are now out on the street, not being able to pay their rent or having mental illnesses. So this COVID has just worsened the lives of so many people. And um, I think it's important for us to be grateful and for us to be there for them as much as we can and to see whether we can do things to improve um, the condition of life for so many people. I'm going to read a poem by Kitty O'Meara. O'Meara, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Kitty is an Irish American retired teacher and chaplain who worked in palliative care. She's a passionate environmental advocate and lives with her husband, five rescue dogs, and three cats in Madison, Wisconsin. When she retired, she couldn't figure out what to do, especially during the pandemic, to deal with her fear and stress like we all experience. Her husband told her to do what she's good at, to write, so she did. And in March of 2020, in one sitting, out popped this thoughtful poem inspired by the pandemic that went viral all over the world. She doesn't love all the attention, but knowing that her poem is offering solace and hope to so many people during this difficult time gives her life meaning. And I'm quoting from what she said. I'd like to share with you parts one and two of her originally unnamed poem, which nonetheless was given the title in the time of pandemic. And I hope that it will bring you solace and hope and fundamentally reinforce your humanistic values. And the people stayed home and they read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still. And they listened more deeply some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamt new images and created new ways to live. And they healed the earth fully as they had been healed. And some illusions slipped away and some men saw their power vanish, but reached and grasped and struggled, returned to work they commanded, build walls they ordered, Spend money on things you do not need. Blame the other. Fear strangers. Respect my power. And the people said, no. They said, you do not own our gifts. They are ours alone to share. The earth and her people are out of balance. The medicine is another way we must be still. The illness is our teacher. We will listen to the lessons. The earth is home to all and we will heal ourselves and balance will be restored. The earth is home to all and we will nurse the stranger and we will feed the stranger and we will shelter the stranger and we will love the stranger within and without. The earth is home to all.
Thank you. Thank you, Eva. I'd like to share with you a song of hope. It's a song that many of our communities use. It's also still popular in Israel, even having been written many, many years ago. It's an adaptation of a song by the Beatles that many of us know. It's Lu Yehi, May It Be. like to ask Rabbi Miriam Jarris, Rabbi of the Society for Humanistic Judaism, for her thoughts as well. Thanks, Adam. You know, sometimes I've seen my role in this movement as someone to say, okay, let's stop and pay attention to what's happening here. And this is one of those moments. So I want to thank Adam and all of you who participated today. It's the first time we've done an all movement observance and it's been very moving and very meaningful. Um, I've been monitoring the chat throughout and so I um, recommend that if you are a panelist, if you just look in the chat, most of what people are saying are thank yous for a moving presentation of sharing a very heartbreaking story. And um, I feel humbled and privileged um, to just share a little bit about what I've been thinking. So secular humanistic Jews stand out in Jewish life and in general, I think, because we're honest. We tell the truth. We base what we say on science, and on reality. And that has become extraordinarily helpful to me as we've navigated this nightmarish reality that we are living today. So anxiety, and we've heard this from others, sadness, fear, loneliness, depression, and grief are all really normal responses to the losses that we have experienced throughout this pandemic losing a loved one during and on account of COVID magnifies that loss. We are often separated and cannot be with our loved one as they die. And there are other losses. Many of us miss our children, our grandchildren, siblings, parents, extended family members and closest friends. And I miss hugs from all of you. What I've learned in my lifetime, and this understanding is firmly rooted in humanism, is that the one thing I can control is how I respond to my reality. I learned this from Viktor Frankl, and I learned it from Sherwin Wine. So I want to read now Sherwin Wine's poem called Hope it's something that I think about and read when I am despairing. And I hope that sharing with it with you today will bring you some comfort. I believe. I believe in hope. I believe in hope that chooses, that chooses self-respect above pity. 
I believe in hope that dismisses, that dismisses the petty fears of petty people. I believe in hope that feels, that feels distant pleasure as much as momentary pain. I believe in hope that acts, that acts without the guarantee of success. I believe in hope that kisses, that kisses the future with the transforming power of its will. Hope is a choice, never found, never given, always taken. Some wait for hope to capture them. They act as the prisoners of despair. Others go searching for hope. They find nothing but the reflection of their own anger. Hope is an act of will, affirming in the presence of evil that good things will happen, preferring in the face of failure, self-esteem to pity. Optimists laugh even in the dark. They know that hope is a lifestyle, not a guarantee. Thank you, Miriam. And now Miriam has encouraged us to look forward with hope and a song that we sing in our movement and in the Jewish world to celebrate hope is our adaptation, Naase Shalom, which I will play now. And if you know the song where you are, you're welcome to sing it as loudly as the people sitting next to you will allow. Two thousand six hundred years ago, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. And some centuries later, a book was written entitled The Book of Lamentations in Hebrew Echa that remembered that destruction. But what they remembered about the destruction is particularly poignant today as we remember the losses of 2020. The first line of the book is Echa Yashva Badad Ha'ir Rabati Am Haita. Ka'almana. Alas, lonely sits the city, once great with people, like a widow. The loss of life is so painful. Yet this lament from 2,600 years ago begins with the loneliness. Lonely sits the city, once great with people. Today, lonely sit the people, once experiencing great cities and landscapes and communities. Yet as we have discovered in 2020, being physically apart does not mean being alone. I want to thank all of my colleagues who offered insight and emotion, personal sharing and beautiful imagery, words, music, and connection. I want to thank Rabbi Shlomit Myers, Rabbi Judith Side, Rabbi Sivan Moss, Rabbi Denise Handlarski, Gloria Pinku, Rabbi Jody Kornfeld, Terry Waslow, Marla Davis, Rabbi Greg Epstein, Rabbi Eva Goldfinger, Rabbi Miriam Jerris, and Rabbi Susan Averbach. One more time, thank you all for coming. Stay safe, stay warm, stay well, and welcome to 2021. <laughs>